Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation uh, for the organizers, the scientific committee. I'm very glad to be here. Um, well, even if it is online, I would have preferred to be in, in Lumini, which is uh, certainly one of the places that I like uh, the most. But here in, in Germany, we are in the middle of the second semester. We are a bit delayed with respect to the international calendar. And this makes that we are now fully devoted to, you know, in particular to the teaching in the master and the preparation of the master uh, final exams and so on. So, um, yeah, I remember uh, it was probably five years ago now that I think that we were meeting in, in Rome to, to celebrate uh, Pier Marco 60. And uh, here we are. So this proves that uh, unlike some other colleagues, unfortunately, that could not do it, we, we were able to, you know, to transit these difficult two years of COVID. And um, it's my great pleasure to, you know, to meet you uh, today here at this occasion, in particular in this conference that is organized. I mean, this is a singular conference, right? Organized by Japan, uh, France, and, and Italy. I have seen uh, several bilateral conferences, trilateral conferences, but I think it's the first time I see it from uh, between Japan, France, and Italy, and I really like it very much, right? So these are certainly three of the of the of the countries where I would really love to live if I had a, a second life, right? Um, well, uh, thinking on, on on the audience uh, brought probably as uh, Pier Marco himself was indicating. Uh, which is in agreement of uh, with his trajectory, right? So uh, I think everyone knows Pierre Marco for his activity in some area. Probably not all of them uh, or not all of us know all he has done, right? Some people know him as a person doing, uh, I don't know, Hamilton Jacobi, some others by doing, um, uh, for instance, heat equations with the generated coefficients and Carleman inequalities. So uh, his spectrum is very broad. And then I thought maybe I should try to make also a broad lecture in which, uh, you know, I will be formulating a number of problems that I think uh, deserve some attention. And I'm confident there is plenty of math to be done, right? Uh, oftentimes, whenever we are, we are thinking on a control system, either finite dimensional or PD1, uh, we do it in a mathematical way, right? We say, let omega be a bounded domain, let the PD, let us assume that the control is placed on the boundary, let's see how much we can do. Of course, if you go a bit, uh, you do a, a, a retrospective, uh, say, thinking on how problems are formulated in practice, there is more room for at the modeling level, right? And in particular, there is more room uh, at, uh, at the moment in which you are deciding what, where to place your actuators or your sensors. Uh, as you know, Norbert Wiener uh, defined uh, cybernetics as the science of communication and control in animals and machines, uh, which means, in other words, that if you want to uh, say, be able to actuate on a system efficiently, you have to gather enough information about the evolution of that system. So you need sensors to record information and then through some either black box uh, uh, open loop or, or some, uh, say, closed loop feedback uh, control methodology to implement the control uh, through actuators. I will not, uh, you know, get too much into the details about whether we are talking about sensors or actuators, I will just uh, discuss this problem of, of, of placement, right? Well, uh, there are many motivations for this. Every application of control theory, as I said, the issue of where to place uh, sensors or actuators will really be a relevant matter. That's not really, uh, you know, uh, it's independent of whether you are considering problems in biomechanics or gas transport, sensors and actuators will always be a must, right? So in, in this academic year, uh, taking the opportunity that uh, Ilias Ftui, who is a postdoc in our team uh, coming from Paris, uh, is an expert in optimal shape design, I, I told Ilias, so maybe we should think on this problem in a more geometric manner, right? So actually, um, uh, in, the, in the previous slide, I was showing this gas network, right? So here in Erlangen, uh, Alex Martin is the is the coordinator of a big, uh, say, national transregio project, which is precisely devoted to the modeling, the analysis, and the optimization 
of gas uh, networks, right? Uh, and of course, when you look to these to the models, right? So I mean, the, the complexity of the networks, the size of the networks, the complex flow, you know, all the all the junctions that there are on it, you you really wonder whether one day one will be able to get to the end of the history and be able to say with a complete understanding of the dynamics and the capacity of uh, running a fusion of medical simulations and doing control in an effective manner. Now, a posteriori. I will think on where to place the controls or the sensors, right? So I thought maybe in, in some cases, right, the complexity of the problem is so large, right, is so huge that we should think in a more elementary manner, right? And then think more, at least a priori, right, in a geometric fashion. So probably the best way to address these problems of optimal placement of sensors and actuators is kind of a multi-scale process rather than trying to have, as I said, a complete understanding of the model from the very beginning to determine what the location should be. Maybe we need to proceed in a, in a uh, say, multi-scale manner, in an iterative manner, and then start from some purely geometrical considerations to then enrich our, say, collocation strategies by feeding extra information that is coming out of the system, right? So now, what about uh, optimal placement just from a geometric point of view? You will think on, on geometric terms, you will probably say, well, uh, then I will try to place the, the actuator that might have a given shape or the shape of the actuator or the sensor might uh, also be something that you might probably modify, right? So here I took, we took just one ellipse so we assume we have a patch, an ellipse, and we have to place it in the bigger domain, which is another ellipse. So probably you will say uh, an optimal placement of this, uh, say, uh, sensor here will be uh, that on which the distance, uh, somehow the maximal distance from any point in the large domain to the sensor is minimized, right? So that seems to be a very natural condition in the sense that if I will place this sensor very much shifted to the left, right? it will be probably very good to capture information that is being propagated on the left side of the medium, but somehow the information on the propagation of waves or, you know, of heat, you know, uh, process, uh, whatever we are considering on the other extreme of the domain will be perceived much more weakly, right? So then it looks like a very natural condition to say, let us minimize the maximal distance from the exterior boundary to the sensor location. And then, uh, of course, if you do that, uh, sorry, there seems to be a small delay. Uh, if you do that, you immediately realize that you have to put some constraints on the geometry or the topology of the sensor, right? Because otherwise, you would simply cut this sensor on many you know, slides, slices, so many small patches, and then you will cover the domain in a homogenization kind of pattern. You will cover the domain by mini patches so that, of course, the minimum distance, or sorry, the maximum distance will, will go down to zero, right? So we have to somehow avoid the possible presence of this relaxation or, or um, homogenization uh, processes. Uh, definitely, uh, you can do it from geometric considerations. You can start simply out of the exterior boundary, shrinking the domain, you know, uh, according to the distance function, right? Which is, of course, higher than the Hamilton Jacobi is there, because if you would like to compute the distance function, you will have to solve a Hamilton Jacobi equation. If you will consider a domain which is uh, convex to start with, you will be lucky that you know the sensors are smaller and smaller and smaller will remain to be, say, simply connected. And then regardless of what is the size of the sensor you are, you are allocating to me, so what is the volume fraction of the large domain I can occupy with the sensor, we will be able to determine what the, the optimal uh, sensor location is. Uh, now, if you think in terms of graphs, uh, something that is relevant in this gas uh, project I was mentioning to you, right? So we are more considering propagation of gas on these networks rather than on 2D or three-dimensional domains. Um, you, you have a, a clear intuition of what's going on, right? So you give me a graph in blue, and then you tell me, okay, you have to place a sensor 
uh, in red. If you let me that, uh, if you allow me that the sensor is occupying, say, 90% of the graph, then what I will simply do is I will start simply contracting the graph from the exterior boundary towards the interior in a way that all these distances on the extremes are equal, right? And in this way, you will see this kind of um, sensor in red pattern appearing. Of course, this is a very large sensor. You would like to make it in practice much smaller. And then you immediately see how in this case, as soon as the sensor is getting smaller, because of this uh, distance criterion to the exterior boundary uh, considerations in the middle figure here, you will see how the sensor will have the tendency to split. This is precisely what you will encounter also on Euclidean domains if you don't start from a convex uh, configuration. And then you see the, the stream case here to the right, right, where the sensor is very narrow, and eventually this distance criterion will tell you, well, you need to place the sensor in two different small patches strategically collocated on the, on the interior of the network, right? Um, this is one category of problems. Just follow the distance function. Use either geometric criteria, or if you want, you can think also in terms of the, of the distance function or, or level set uh, methods. Uh, there is uh, oftentimes in engineering practice, uh, the strategy is different, right? And people will tell you, well, listen, we are not really, uh, we are not really ready to implement very sophisticated geometrical shapes for the, for the sensors. For us, the sensors is either one patch or two patches or three patches or four patches or n patches. They have a given geometry and then you have to determine what is the optimal location. Then, you know, these problems will simply become problems about, uh, you know, discrete optimization. You have to, after all, in the case of four patches, if the radius of these patches is given, the only thing you have to determine is the center of gravity. The existing of an optimal shape will be obviously an optimal collocation will be obvious. The complexity will be, of course, at the level of, uh, say, uh, computational optimization, because the problem under consideration will not be compact, right? Um, in any case, uh, even if you say, OK, let's uh, stick to the first uh, idea of, of, of doing the optimal location of sensors and actuators just following the distance function, it looks like we are doing it without uh, any PDE, background PDE, right? But we know this is not completely true, right? Uh, behind the distance function, there is the aconal equation. So you will be dealing with a problem of optimal design, optimal shape design for the aconal equation. And you can bypass, uh, you know, certainly the, the audience knows this better than I. You can bypass uh, somehow the complexity of the aconal equation in two different manner. Uh, one, there is a classical result by Bear Cabal that says that the uh, solutions of the conal equation can be achieved as the limit of the p Laplacian equation when p goes to infinity. That's one possibility. Then in some sense, you can take uh, p to be very large, so truncate over there, say p equal 100, and then uh, address your optimal design problem for the p Laplacian, right? That's one possibility. Uh, this will give you a good approximation of the, of the overall final goal. Uh, the problem will be nonlinear, though. Uh, another possibility for doing this is rather to use this uh, theorem by classical theorem by Varada, right? Now 50 years old, right? In which, uh, in this, in this uh, celebrated papers, uh, Varada was uh, comparing uh, the geometry of a manifold, right? So the geodesics of a manifold with with the asymptotic shape of the Gaussian heat kernel on, on this manifold in short times, right? He established these asymptotics that say that what we see for the Gaussian on the Euclidean space, T minus dimension D over two exponential minus X minus Y squared divided by four T is the same you will see in any manifold or for say variable coefficient elliptic equations asymptotically when t is small under the condition that you replace x minus y squared by the geodesic distance from x to y, right? That, that's what he said about the green function for parabolic problems 
in manifolds or for PDEs with uh, variable coefficients. One, one of the auxiliary results he establishes in that paper is this singular limit process, which says, well, if uh, you solve uh, minus epsilon Laplace and W plus W equal to zero with boundary conditions equal to one, and you let uh, epsilon go to zero, in this logarithmic scale, you recover again the distance function. So this gives you, right, uh, the idea that uh, the hint that even when you are uh, simply considering the problem of optimal collocation of sensors and actuators from a purely uh, geometric perspective, you are somehow dealing with the Laplacian, which is nice for us uh, because you know we are used to work with uh, uh, partial differential equations, and uh, among them, certainly the Laplacian is probably the nicest one uh, you can think of, right? So then, uh, the first then uh, conclusion of this first part of the talk is that probably when you are addressing these problems before getting into the full complexity of the model under consideration, it's better to think on optimal collocation from a purely geometric perspective, but eventually doing it geometrically very much means that you are doing it for the Laplacian, in the sense that, as we know well, somehow, you know, the, the solutions of minus Laplacian u equal one, or the first eigen function of the Laplacian, are, are, you know, uh, twins of the geometry of the domain that you are considering. And this idea can also be transported to the context of optimal collocation of sensors and actuators. Of course, things will be intrinsically tricky as soon as the geometry is not very elementary, right? So you see, it, for example, in this, in this uh, say, papillon uh, shape uh, domain, right? in which, uh, well, this is our domain omega, we have to place an actuator or a sensor. And if you let me that the sensor occupies, say, 90% of the domain, it will be just a contraction of the exterior domain. But when you make the size of the domain to shrink, you will realize that here you will generate a singularity, right? In the sense that the from propagating from this corner and this corner will collide before filling this information over there. This is simply due to the fact that the solution of the iconal equation in this in this case, right, has this kind of uh, double uh, pyramidal uh, say shape, meaning that if the patch is very large, you will of course take the a large level set of this pyramid that will be say a massive set, but if you try to get uh, sensors that are much uh, tinier, which is often the case, then you will rather have the tendency to concentrate the two sensors in two little triangles or quasi triangles that are concentrated in the center of these two, say, foci or I, okay? Good. Okay, so this is not the first time we work in this problem. Um, uh, for, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, or even earlier, I remember that uh, Yannick Privat was visiting us in, in, uh, in Bilbao at that time. Uh, I had seen a paper by Paco Periago uh, where he was considering, and there was also a paper by Antoine Anro considering similar, uh, similar questions. I will mention more in detail uh, what these other uh, people did in this topic. I was very curious about this topic. I started to talk with uh, Yannick Privac soon after. Yannick at that time, I think, was doing a postdoc with Emmanuel Trela. We started working together and we wrote a number of papers. There, the perspective was totally different, right? So uh, we started, for some reason, considering the wave equation. I think the motivation for considering the wave equation was that the previous papers by by Antoine Anro and Paco Periago were on this model. And of course, uh, wave equation is probably one of the most, uh, say, distinguished PDs, in which we know that there is full of complexity on it, right? There is a lot of geometric complexity. We know that the propagation of waves is driven by B characteristic rays. Uh, this leads to the dynamics of the billiard. There is a lot of geometry on this problem. And then we thought, what will be the most natural problem to look at it uh, in the context of control, right? So uh, ignore the control. You just think of the problem of placing a, a sensor in order to be able to record all waves propagating in the domain capital omega. I am placing zero boundary conditions just to, 
simplify the presentation. So the question is, where do you place the micro so that you better record all the acoustic waves that are propagating in, in the chamber in which you are? Of course, the same question could be, could be considered for the system of elasticity, then things will be more complicated because the existence of different types of waves, you know, the longitudinal and the transversal waves, the scalar acoustic wave equation seems to be the simplest one, okay? You can formulate the problem in any dimension. And then I ask you the question is very simple. For me, uh, a sensor small omega is, is appropriate, is successful, if in a given finite time window, right, uh, the measurement in L2 of the norm of the, of the solution in this, the restriction to a small omega, is able right, to recover the full energy of the system because we are making measurements in L2. The natural topology for the initial data is L2 for the position and H minus one for the velocity. So there are many situations in which we know that this inequality is true. So one of them, for instance, will be when the, when the sensor is placed uh, near the boundary, right? If, if this is the sensor is small omega, so it's just a, a say, a a cover of the wall, of the whole walls of the, of the cavity in which waves are propagating, you know that this inequality will be true because eventually all rays of geometric optics, sooner or later, on a time which is somehow of the order of the diameter of the large domain, will pass by, the sensor will be recorded, and therefore this inequality will be true. Okay? Now, how do I... Um, distinguish the quality of a sensor with respect to another. How can I say whether this sensor is doing the job well or not? Well, of course, is in terms of the size of this constant. So you could fix time, a time window, say, of the order of the diameter of the domain, and then say for this time window, or say twice the diameter of the domain to be on the safe side, please tell me what is the small domain omega with a given volume fraction, because otherwise you will cover the whole domain omega. So say uh, a small omega occupying 10% of the large omega so that the constant in this inequality not only exists, but is minimized, right? Because the smaller this constant is, the better you are capturing. So think that one over C, you place the C dividing here, one over C is the percentage of the total energy you are recovering. So when you minimize C, you are improving the observability properties that this sensor provides. Okay, so we try that, it's very elementary. You say, let's write down solutions in Fourier series. Uh, there is nothing difficult on this. You have the spectrum of the Laplacian. You can write it in complex exponential or otherwise with sine and cosine functions. And then you compute the integral in a small omega to really see what the energy uh, you are capturing in the sensor is, right? Of course, the total energy of the solution will be simply the small little L2 norm of all these uh, Fourier coefficients, right? So the sum of the moduli of Zk squared, right? And then the question is how much energy there is in there. So you, this, of course, becomes a double sum. And then you get to this. Uh, there is, of course, the time, uh, say, contribution from here. You get also the, the, the integrals of these, uh, say, trigonometric polynomials uh, with respect to time. I should place here a dt, right? dt. Uh, and this is what you get. Uh, and now when you see this, uh, you immediately realize the problem is very tricky, right? Because somehow, if you want to determine what is the quality of the sensor, you should be able to say something substantial about how you know the mutual orthogonality or quasi-orthogonality or the interactions of all eigenfunctions when restricted to, to a small omega r. We know that the uh, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian are mutually orthogonal in capital omega, and then this will become a diagonal term, right? A diagonal sum, just a single sum, right? But in the case of a sensor small omega the mastery of this matrix of interactions of uh, the various eigenfunctions of the Laplacian as a function of the location of the set small omega is very, very tricky. So actually this problem, as far as I know, uh, this was not, never handled, okay? That's also a very interesting topic. Now what we did at that time was to use a, a spectral relaxation. There are two ways of doing this. So one way, I mean, uh, this is uh, using this, this classical idea of uh, orthogonality of trigonometric polynomials in infinite time, right? 
So this is something I learned during my PhD in Paris with Alana Rowe, uh, you know, people working in the asymptotic behavior um, uh, of, of wave-like equations with dissipative terms, a very Italian topic as well, uh, like Amerio and Prose. And then, of course, uh, uh, Pierre Marco has been working on this uh, also systematically with uh, uh, Patrick Martinez and, and Judith Valconstenoble. So the idea is the following. If rather than thinking on a finite time, basically you let time go to infinity, all these trigonometric polynomials become orthogonal. So this means that even if you don't have any clue about how the eigenfunctions are interacting, because you are looking to this observation problem in infinite time, right? then all the off-diagonal terms will disappear and you will be led to a diagonal problem like the one I am indicating here, right? So the first remark is that if you will think in terms of infinite time, of course you will tell me nobody has infinite time to make measurements of waves, this is true. This is a mathematical idealization, but still it helps a lot because then immediately you are led to a purely a spectral inequality. The second way in which you can do that using, is using this classical lemma of Sigmund, right? That says that uh, if you take, you know, we have uh, Plancher L, right? That says if you take L2, little L2 Fourier coefficients, the function will be in L2. But what Sigmund observed is that if you randomize the signs of this, say, Fourier series just by multiplying the Fourier coefficients by minus one to the power, uh, say, alpha k, alpha k being a random number, either zero and one, so you randomize the signs of these Fourier coefficients with probability one, this Fourier series that was just in L2 now will be a function that is in every L4, LP, L28, the, the one you want. So it's not completely intuitive because the amplitude of these coefficients is preserved, yet the fact that you are, uh, say, uh, uh, reordering in a random manner the signs on these series, right? This reminds, uh, you know, very much this... Uh, you know, classical theorems we teach to students in the first year calculus class about how you can rearrange series, you know, which are converging or not according to the to the, the change in the oscillations of the signs of the of the general term. What he said, this is something that happens, and actually, what you can uh, do, and this was exploited by Nicolas Burke and collaborators in order to solve a number of nonlinear, uh, say, uh, evolution equations like Navier-Stokes or Schrodinger to go beyond the critical threshold is to say, well, rather than formulating the Cauchy problem in the classical manner in which, you know, given an initial datum, I have to solve the PD in the forward sense. And then, you know, for instance, Navier-Stokes 3D, you will never do it, right? Uh, this is still an open problem. You will relax the problem by saying, okay, let me, given an initial datum, look to all the class of randomized initial data it generates, and let me try to solve the Cauchy problem with probability one. The fact that you move from L2 integrability to any LP integrability, of course, allows you to go beyond the critical threshold, right? On the nonlinearities you can allow, right? Uh, in, the, in the classical Cauchy problem theory. You do the same here, and then you say, well, rather than look into this kind of inequalities for all solutions, I look for the inequality, but just for randomized data with probability one, and exactly in the same manner as when time goes to infinity, you get to this inequality, this spectral inequality. And then it looks like at least nicer to begin with, okay? This is not equivalent to the original problem, it's a relaxation. Good. Now, with this relaxation, you realize that now the problem is purely a spectral. You have to determine where you have to place a small omega so that for every eigenfunction, you are capturing the maximum energy out of it, okay? And now, this is precisely where the works by first uh, Antoine Aro, then Paco Periago, and so on came. People observe that a relaxation process occurs. Let me just show you in a video. The, the video goes a little bit fast, right? But this is what happens. So what does happen? So let me see if I can stop the video sometime. No. Um, 
So this video is representing the following. If you just consider the first Hagen function, this is the first Hagen function of the Laplacian in 1D squared, and then you tell me that the path the sensor can only occupy one third of the domain, you will of course place it in the center because this is where the maximum of the first Hagen function occurs. Okay. But now, if you look to how good it is, this segment, in order to observe the second Hagen function, the square here in blue, you realize that the sensor is placed in the worst possible location because it's precisely on a minimum of the absolute value of the second Hagen function. Actually, for the second Hagen function, it would be much better to cut this sensor into two and place one piece over there and the other one over here. Actually, when you do the computation, this is what you observe. You compute the best location of the sensor for the first n Hagen functions, and you see that this is the worst possible one for the n plus one. And this is why, when you say, OK, I want a sensor that is occupying one third of the domain, the answer to the problem is, well, then the problem will relax and the solution will be just a density function that is telling you you have to put 33% of sensor everywhere in the domain. So you get a measure, a constant measure in this case, and not really the characteristic function of the location of the sensor. So this is the first, uh, say, uh, conclusion. Even when you simplify the problem, there is a high risk of relaxation. This is because the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian are equidistributed and are telling you that if you are paying attention just to the eigenfunctions, even if this is a relaxed version of the problem, you have to cover the full domain. Of course, when you move into multidimensional domains, Questions are much more tricky because after all, the relaxation in 1D is related to the fact, the trivial fact that the square of Hagen functions converge weakly to the constant. This is something that doesn't occur when you are in multidimensional domains, where you have, for instance, the, the whispering gallery phenomena, you know, uh, uh, Hagen functions concentrated near the boundary of a domain, right, of a, of a convex domain. And, and this is uh, very much related also to the dynamics of the billiard. And this is a still a topic uh, under consideration in which you try to relate the geometry of the domain to the ergodicity of the dynamic of the billiard, right, with the equidistribution of Hagen functions, which somehow will be telling you where the sensors should be located or not, right? There are, of course, uh, particular. Um, say, geometries in which you can find optimal lo uh, locations that behave very much like uh, the t-shirts of your preferred uh, soccer teams. This is waves. Of course, things improve when you are dealing with the heat equation. You can randomize the heat equation again. You can make the problem to become, uh, say, a spectral. But now, because of the dissipativity of the heat equation, you will see that there is an exponentially say, penalizing factor that is telling you, well, you should pay less and less and less attention to the, say, high frequencies. The longer is the time window, the more you enhance this penalization process so that actually when you are optimizing the spectral collocation of sensors for the heat equation in very long time, you will just do it according to the first Hagen function, and then you will get this. If the time is a little bit shorter, the second Hagen function of the Laplacian will also play a role. Then you will get this kind of shape. Three Hagen functions, time a bit shorter, right? And then, of course, when you get to the asymptotic limit where t is going to zero, what's going to happen? When you let t go to zero, then ah, you will recall Varadhan. Varadhan is the one who said, even for the heat equation, when time is short, the heat equation is following you know, the geodesics of the manifold, then you will be back to the first section in which the, the geometric optimal location of the sensor will be given by the distance function. And then uh, you will have to deal fully with the geometric formulation of the problem. OK, so we have done numerics on this. Uh, I will not get into too much details uh, on this matter, just a warning. This is something that is well known and that has an impact in particular in this setting. Let me just show you this video because 
uh, numerics of waves is delicate. So if numerics of waves is delicate, when you are trying to reproduce numerically the optimal location of sensors for waves, then of course it will be very tricky because if you don't have a good tool to say simulate waves, of course the optimal locations you will get in the discrete setting will not be guaranteed to converge to the optimal location in the continuous one, right? And, and this is a simulation of how waves uh, propagate, right? Uh, in 1D under discretization, right? So this, this seems to be fine. This seems to be fine. So I don't know how I can stop. Uh, well, it seems I cannot stop. This seems to be fine, except for something, right? When you look to this, uh, say, image uh, up uh, to the right, you see that waves are propagating, apparently, according to characteristics. But before they get to the boundary, they bounce back. So you see, this is a purely numerical phenomena. The way waves propagate is like uh, here down to the left, where waves propagate fo following characteristics. According to D'Alembert, they get to the boundary and then they go back again and again and again. But here we see that the numerical algorithms, and this is just doing finite differences for solving the D'Alembert equation, is producing this kind of waves, and this can be done analytically. These are Gaussian beads. Right, that are concentrated somehow in the interior of the domain, and that seems to be, they seem to be repelled by a fictitious wall that actually doesn't exist. So actually, this phenomena, even at higher frequencies, is enhanced here to you know, top to the left, in which you see kind of a standing Gaussian beams vertically propagating. Actually, it's not vertically propagating, it's propagating to the left and to the right. But this phenomena of you know reverberation of, of bouncing back right on artificial walls is so much enhanced that actually you see these uh, uh, fictitious numerical waves standing. What is the reason for this? How do you get these simulation dolls? Actually, it's very easy. You take a very high frequency wave and you take a mesh. You take a mesh for the finite differences which is much finer in the interior and a bit coarser near the boundary. What happens then? Well, waves leave where they can survive. This is like people, right? We leave where there is water, right? Otherwise, we, we migrate, right? And this is what waves do. The mesh is fine enough so that this very high frequency Gaussian beam can survive while the mesh is fine, but as soon as the wave gets you know, to the border of this discrete mesh, which is not a physical boundary of the domain, the physical boundary of the domain is here outside. But as soon as the wave gets to this border of the discrete mesh, in which the mesh becomes too coarse, if the mesh becomes too coarse, the wave cannot be represented there because this is a high frequency wave, and therefore the wave will come back. Right? So the wave will have the tendency to remain in the comfort region in which it can be represented. Okay, And this is a, a very important warning. Be careful if uh, you decide that the analysis of this problem is too complicated and you get into numerics, things will get even more complicated because there is this dichotomy that numerical algorithms are capable of capturing low frequency waves but never properly the high frequency ones, OK? Um, now, just to conclude, uh, this is another trial we did recently. So Borjan Deskowski, who was a PhD student in our team, and now he's a uh, postdoc in, in MIT in, with uh, uh, Laurent de Manette, um, I say to, to Borjan, well, come on. I mean, we should be able to do something about this. Actually, we got to this question he was working on uh, residual neural networks, right, and the and the optimal, say, uh, uh, activation of the of the coefficient of the deep neural network for, say, learning and training and so on, and and again uh, the same question like emerge, right? And in that case, in a finite dimensional nonlinear context, and I said to Borjan, listen, in my opinion, we don't even know how to solve this, okay? So this is like a catastrophe, right? So even in the context of linear algebra, we don't know how to do this. Let me tell you what we were able to do. And this will give you an idea 
of how much there is to be done in this area and how rapidly things that apparently are naive get extremely challenging. So we said the following. Now, let's be A, B, a matrix. It can be a top-lich matrix, like the three-diagonal, say, uh, matrix you get by this case in the Laplacian, for instance, right? It's kind of a discrete heat equation. Or, of course, you can write also in the system form the wave operator discretized. So this can be a finite difference discretization of any, any PDE you have in mind, OK? And this is governed by the matrix A. And now the control is just a scalar function. So you have a controller, it's just B, right? It's, it's just uh, the vector, the column vector B is telling you how the, the intensity of the control UT is, say, distributed along the N components of the system. A is a matrix N times N, and B is a vector Rn. U is the intensity, and I simply ask you, can you please tell me, given the matrix E of the system, A of the system, it could be, for instance, a social network, right? So you are modeling some network dynamics, and A is the linear matrix giving you the connectivity of this network. Can you please tell me simply, how should I wait, you know, the action of the control on, any, on every node, what is the optimal V of, say, norm one, of course, right? Because we can normalize always to have V of norm one. So that you better observe or control the system, this problem is, to a large extent, open. Let me tell you what we know. So we said, well, this is very simple, apparently. We know from the Kalman rank condition that the vectors B that allow me to control the system are those that uh, so that the rank of B, A, B up to N, A, N minus 1, B is full. This set, of course, of vectors is non-empty, and this is an open class, right? Generically, also, you will have that uh, the system is controllable with, with Bs. Of course, there will be Bs for which the rank will be less, and you will fail, but there are plenty of them. So how do I characterize the optimal one? Well, I can do it very simply. I fix the time window just to make things simple. You, you fix the time window, capital T. And I say, listen, whenever uh, B is so that the system is controllable, you will be the control that is driving the initial configuration Y0 to 0 in time T. And then the control will be comparable to the norm of the initial data with a, with a constant, which is the norm of this control operator. And it was just to minimize this constant on the class of unit vectors B in Rn. So whenever you minimize this, uh, say, uh, control constant, you can say the control column B is optimal, is an optimal actuator for this discrete or, say, um, network kind of problem. Um, OK, so you can try to do that uh, directly, uh, no clue. We don't know how to do it, right? Uh, so we said, let's go to the Brunowski canonical form. So the Brunowski canonical form says, uh, you know, matrices fulfilling the Kalman rank condition are, say, similar, right, to the companion matrix, meaning that there is always, a, a um, say, a way of transferring the original matrix into this, say, uh, canonical form, right, of the companion matrix under the condition that the Kalman rank condition is fulfilled. And if you do that, actually, you know, you can track what the operator, say, P, depending on the matrix, will be so that, right, you are transferring the matrix into this canonical form in which the control problem simply looks as being U now is the companion matrix. So this is a trivial matrix in which you are simply linking the derivative of x1 is equal to x2, the derivative of x2 is equal to x3, and all the coupling of the dynamics is led just for the last line in which you are coupling the derivative of xn minus 1 with all the previous components of the vector x. And this is the Brunowski canonical form in which you say, well, listen, we then just control on the last component. And then through a domino-like effect, you expect that controlling the last component in which, you know, all the dynamics has been, uh, say, projected through this uh, coupling of the previous ones, then you are able to, in cascade, control the full system. So this gives you a, a systematic way of formulating the problem. Why? Because eventually, I am led 
sorry, there is some delay on the slides, and this is why probably uh, the version and the speech that doesn't match. Uh, you are led to consider this canonical problem in which, of course, now everything is given. U is the companion matrix of A, which is given. The structure of this vector is just 0, 0, 0, 1. There is nothing to be discussed. This problem has a cost of control. And therefore, because of this transformation of the Grunowski canonical form, now you can determine what is the cost of control for any other possible vector B. And in this way, you know, in this way, right, you see that the cost of control for a given B will be given by the norm of this operator P inverse, that if you characterize using a spectral considerations, you will finally, you know, end up uh, writing it that way. So eventually, you get to the problem of maximizing within the class of vectors B, column vectors B of norm one, the minimal value of this uh, huge matrix in which, uh, unfortunately, other than you know the product of BB transport, you also have all these polynomials that are carried out out of the Brunowski transformation. So this is just the reformulation of the problem in the final dimensional case. Now this problem, you know, uh, even even in the case of a two by two system in which the matrix is this one, you identify the Laplacian in the trivial case where there are only two nodes, already brings you some surprises. So before, I mean, first of all, because of symmetry consideration, there is not a unique optimal placement of the, of the vector B. There are two of them. But what is even more surprising is that when you compute uh, explicitly what the optimal B is, you get these strange numbers. So don't ask me why. OK, and, and uh, the second remark is that when we try to move on, even in a, say, purely computational way, we will never be able to do more than top linked matrices, like the discrete Laplacian, be joined the dimension 9. Even in dimension 9, the codes we were able to build in order to optimize, right? So this is the case of the sphere, for instance. This is telling you where the optimal Bs are located in the sphere. We were not able to really uh, able to develop efficient computational codes to do it for large dimension. Dimension nine, it took us eight hours in the laptop. OK, just to conclude, because I'm running out of time, the, op the problem of optimal sensors and actuators can be formulated in many different manners. Probably from a practical perspective, the best is not to do it in just one single form, but try to integrate all this new how and do it in a multi-scale manner, trying to keep the problem, say, with a limited complexity. But still, even in the simplest formulations, like the finite dimensional, uh, say, dynamics, of course, there is plenty to be done. And, and, and of course, this will have plenty of also bifurcations and implications if you will move into a nonlinear context. In particular, if you are thinking, for instance, not only on nonlinear PDEs, but possibly also on the dynamics of, of deep neural networks. So thank you again. Um, uh, uh, muchas felicidades, uh, Pierre Marco, y espero que. Uh, Pronto podamos celebrar, bueno, no pronto, dentro de cinco años podamos celebrar eh, los 70 a todos con buena salud. Gracias. Chao. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice talk. Uh, there are some questions. Please. No question. Everything was clear. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> Another clap. <laughs>